Hey, I'm Jonathan Carter. I'm a associate professor of surgery here at UCSF, and we're about to do a RTAP uh, procedure, which stands for Robotic Trans Abdominal Preperitoneal Inguinal Hernia Repair. The patient is 65 years old, presented with a unilateral symptomatic inguinal hernia, which did not extend down into the scrotum. And after discussion techniques, he uh, was really interested in the minimally invasive technique. So as we go in, it's a pretty straightforward uh, case. Patients never had prior abdominal surgery. Uh, the hernia is not that big. Um, so we're expecting a fairly straightforward case, no curveballs thrown at us. Uh, I think the most important thing in these cases is just a meticulous dissection of the peritoneum off the abdominal wall, uh, taking care to preserve and identify all the key structures. So as we head in there and I'm doing the dissection, I'll be sure to point out um, the little pitfalls and anatomical landmarks as we go along. It's gonna be fun, here we go. Up, we're going to do a uh, right-sided R-tap today. Basic setup, we use a 8 millimeter 0 degree scoped initial port entry. We'll switch and we'll do the whole operation with our 830 scope. Setting up those two scopes. I use a monopolar cautery, which is the green cord. We don't use any bipolar for this case. I've got a spot here for Palmer's point, and then uh, robotic taps, three ports, just above the umbilicus, so pulled back from the umbilicus. And uh, this patient has a right-sided hernia, so we're gonna put a 12 port here, line, and then um, the two eight ports on either side, so all three ports are in a line. So let's mark those out. I'll take a marking pen. Um, I generally never put a laparoscopic port through the midline, so one of my rules is all ports need to go through muscles, and I do that to avoid hernias and I space the ports about four finger breadths. With the robot, it's not that critical because you don't get a lot of coaxial clash if the ports are too narrow for the wristed for the instruments. Okay, that looks great. All right, so we're gonna achieve pneumoperitoneum using a Palmer's point technique. So I make a small stab at Palmer's point and then I introduce a varus needle into the abdomen. And then as we're insufflating, I always take a look at the vitals. So we're 100 over 68, pulse of 62, and tidal's 37. Our opening pressure is low, and you can see gas is flowing. So we found the peritoneal cavity. Okay, he'll take the local. We can numb up the uh, skin incisions. You can do all three, make a generous skin wheel. For the local, we're gonna do a uh, dermal block. Where we put the ports in, so it's a preemptive analgesic strategy. Then um, ultimately, we're going to close the fascia of the 12 millimeter port with a suture. So we're going to do a rectus sheath block on that into the case. So one of the um, downsides of the current intuitive platform is they don't have an optical 12 uh, trocar anymore. They actually had one and discontinued it. The only 12 that they make now has a uh, solid tip that you can't put a scope through. So what we have to do is we have to open a Covidian 11 optical port to get the first port in, guide it with their zero scope, and then we're quickly going to replace both of these. You can hear his heart rate went up, his end tidal stable, and his blood pressure hasn't moved. And we're up to 15, so now we're ready to go in. So direct optical technique on the insufflated abdomen, sub-Q fat, anterior rectus sheath, rectus muscle. This patient has a pretty beefy rectus muscle, posterior sheath, and then peritoneum. And once we're in the peritoneum, we can sky the little and advance that port. Great. Okay, we can, Joe, we can switch out to the 30 scope now. Okay, so we're gonna hook our gas up to this port. Okay. All right, so now we're gonna use the 30 scope. And we're first gonna go look at the varus needle entry site. There it is. No injury to the underlying viscera. So then I'm going to withdraw the varus needle and we'll proceed with the operation. Okay. And then as we put these ports, we're going to um, adjust the remote center. So you can see there's a thin black line and then a thick black line. The thick black line is the remote center. So that has to be at the fascia. So we'll adjust the depths as we go. We'll port hop. And then uh, my assistant is going to put in his port. This is an eight millimeter port. 
very nice. And then adjust the depth and pull back just a hair. Perfect. Okay. So now we're going to port hop to his port. So this operation is done in, in steep Trendelenburg. Arms are tucked, patient <coughs> supine, go really steep Trendelenburg. And we've actually put a shoulder harness above the shoulders. The patient can't slide. Okay, so this is a barred 3D max mesh. You can see it's a contoured mesh. And you can see the center of concavity is about right here. So I tend to mark that so I can see it robotically. And that's about where the internal ring should go. This is where the um, Cooper's ligament goes, and this is where the pubic tract goes. Inferior epigastric kind of comes up like this. And then we're doing a right side, and so I usually, on the medial side, I'll put the letter R. If I'm doing bilateral, I'll do right and left so I don't confuse the two meshes. Okay, then we're going to soak in bacitracin. And then we're going to introduce the mesh right now. And you don't really need to roll this up, because if you roll it up, you have to waste time unrolling it intra-abdominally. So you can just insert it, support, and it'll go through. You don't have to unfurl it. And then we're just going to swap out our Covidian port for the robotic 12. And look up at that port site, please. And we'll see if you can get it into view. There it goes. All right. So then we'll adjust the remote center. Okay, perfect. All right, let's bring in the robot. Okay, so I've rotated all the... Uh, so they point anteriorly. Okay, Joe, we're going to center on this port, our center port. Okay, so um, what I'm doing is I'm looking at the dynamic range here, and we want that to be about the middle of the uh, dynamic range. Okay, great. Can I get the eight, the eight port downsizer? Okay, so we're going to put in our camera port first. We're going to clutch the camera. We'll come on in. And you can see this is his hernia. Great. Okay. Okay, so I'm going to need a monopolar scissors. Okay, so if you look outside the body, you can triangulate, and then you can just come in. And here we go. Okay, and then I'll take the monopolar cord. Great, and then we're going to go the other side and dock the other arm. This will be a prograsp. So, you know, cost is a big part of robotics, and so surgeons look for ways to kind of minimize costs. Do the case with a prograsp, a monopolar scissors, and then a mega suture cut needle driver. Those are my only three. So I'll take that prograsp. Okay, so now we've got our tips in. So now what we're going to do is just optimize our arms. So you want at least a fist between the booms up here. And then you want to look and see if you can avoid collisions by rotating. I'm going to rotate. We'll come down on this one. So that swings this elbow, so it's pretty far from the table. And this one, way away from this one. We'll leave this one up a little. In general, we try to and then I think I'm going to rotate this one this way. And that looks like pretty good dynamic range. So I think we're ready to go to the console. Look good to you, Mark? All right, rock and roll. So um, we're in the robotic console. So what I like to do first is just um, visually establish my landmarks. So my midline is here. Here's the dome of the bladder. And uh, you can see the uh, medial umbilical ligaments, which is here. And here, that's the obliterated knife. And then I like to look and see where my lateral ligament is, which is the intraepigastrix, and I think it's coming right up through here. It makes this a large indirect hernia, which um, bums me out a little bit because I see kind of a direct when you do robotics. The indirects are a little harder. 
Okay, here's our mesh. We're just going to set this aside. And you can see the patient has just a little tongue of momentum. So I'm going to take this down only because it's going to uh, down on the peritoneum. Okay, so we're going to take down these omental adhesions. I'm trying not to damage the peritoneum, so I'll cheat a little on the omental side. And the only reason is at the end of the case, we're going to want to tack the uh, peritoneum back up. We're not going to want it weighted down by the omentum. Let's do a quick little lysis here and just get this out of the way. Down it goes. Okay, so you can see here back artery. Uh, here's the gonadal vessels coming down to the internal ring. Here is the vas deferens coming up. Um, here's the inferior pagastrix coming up here. You can see the pulsation here. Those are going to come down and plug into the iliac. And visually identify where the iliopubic tract is. Like here's his lateral femoral nerve probably right under there. And the iliopubic tract is running like this. Okay, so now I'm oriented and he's got a giant indirect. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to go about, oh, about six inches above. And we're going to start at the medium bulk ligament. And we're just going to score where we're going to open up the peritoneum. We'll go over the artery about here. And you need to go high enough that you're above where the top edge of the mesh is going to go. And then we'll kind of go up to about here. Great. All right, so I think that'll be good. And once we have scored, we're going to open up the peritoneum. There's actually two planes here to be aware of. There's the peritoneum, and then there's the transversalis fascia. And you can decide which space you want to be in. If you go high enough, there's actually a little bit of posterior rectus sheath if you're above the arcuate line. Um, I find it best to take the transversalis fascia with me. So get up in this plane. And this might even be a little bit of posterior sheath, which is fine. So that we get in, so we bring the transversalis fascia down with the peritoneal flap. Um, the reason to do that is you have a good strong structure to suture to at the end. Now some surgeons just bring peritoneum down with them. And I think that's fine too. Here you can see the lateral attachments of the posterior sheath. And then here's peritoneum over here. So the surgeons who just bring peritoneum say they like to leave the transversalis fascia on the ceiling because that will protect the inferior epigastric artery and its tributaries from inadvertent injury. Um, and I see that argument. The problem is the uh, peritoneum can be sort of wispy thin. At the end, it, you know, sometimes it doesn't want to hold the suture very well. So here's the rectus muscle. And what we're going to do is open up the space. And you can see I opened up a little bit of the posterior sheath. Here's the arcuate line. And we're going to come down. And here's the inferior epigastric vessels. So you can see, if, had we left the transversalis up, this would be covered by a thin layer of connective tissue. So we're going to come down. He's got a tortuous inferior epigastric. What we're going to do is we're going to develop a space from the rectus and the inferior epigastrics medially all the way to the midline. And this is a safe space to dissect in. We're going to go all the way down until we see the tubercle. Almost there. You can see there's a little bit of light. Thing white right at the tip of my right hand. So that's about the right space. Open this up medially. Okay, so you can see the glistening white of the big bone. And that's where the rectus is. In the midline, there is a supportive structure. If we see that today, it's called the adminiculum of the linea alba. And it's right in the midline. And it's a triangular structure. This is very prominent. This guy, you can see it a little bit. See this little band of connective tissue that goes up to the midline? And here's the other side of it. So it forms a triangle. So that's the adminiculum of the linea alba.
and that's just an anatomical marker of the midline. We don't want to do much of the central dissection yet. We just want to get down to where we see the pubic bone medially. So now we're going to go work laterally. So laterally, we're going to create a pocket. And this is just kind of like opening a piece of pita bread. You want to delicately open. And you can take it sharply or bluntly. When I do blunt dissection, I curve my scissors and I use the heel of my scissors as a blunt dissector. And I can use that to stretch. And we're down about to the iliopubic tract right there. And what I want to do, once I'm at the iliopubic tract, I want to leave a little bit of fat on the iliacus muscle because that fat is going to protect the lateral femoral cutaneous nerve. So again, here's the iliopubic tract. I know the nerve is deep to me. And so I just, if I can, I want to leave a little bit of fat because I don't want to lay my mesh directly on that nerve if I can avoid it. So I'm going to leave a little bit of connective tissue on the iliacus. That connective tissue is perfect. And here's the iliopubic tract right along here. Outside, that correlates with to the uh, ligament. See a little nerve here. I don't think that's the main lateral femoral cutaneous. It's just a little branch. That's the lateral dissection. Now I'm going to tackle the medial dissection. So this is the hardest part. You see he's got this giant tract hernia. So our job is just to reduce that, but we can't injure the testicular artery, vein, and vas deferens when we're doing that. Let's take our time. This is the lateral attachment of the transversalis fascia going to the linea semilunaris. So it kind of looks like peritoneum, but it's not. We want to complete our division of that. Okay. In terms of patient selection, I've done 150 robotic cases, mostly inguinal and ventral hernias. I generally shy away from scrotal hernias. And there are some surgeons who feel confidence playing a scrotal hernia, but I feel like uh, that's a relative contraindication to a robotic approach. It can just be challenging because you only have two hands. So one hand can retract. This looks like maybe it's the edge of the sac here, which is beautiful. So we just want to get that peritoneum down. And I'll stop. I just want to point out some visual landmarks. So I can see the uh, venous comatons of the inferior epigastric. And I can see the artery coming down into here. Here's the white glistening artery. It's a pretty good sized artery. It's sending off a big cremasteric branch probably. Or maybe that's the vas. I don't know. Here's the gonadal vasculature. And then the vas deferens, we haven't really seen it. It's lurking down. I think this might be it right here but it's down in this plane. So what we want to do is we want to get this hernia sac back, but we don't want to injure nattles. And the best um, move is a little bit of a sweeping move. So what you do is you pull back on the peritoneum and then you develop the space in this plane. You can see I just ripped the peritoneum a little, which is not my desire. It happens, papery thin it is. So anyway, the move is to sweep like this what that does is that drops the gonadals onto the floor. So you can see there's a plane here. It'll develop. Okay, good. That's coming down. Now I'm starting to see my vas and do my medial dissection. Now there's always a bunch of fat that travels along with the inferior epigastric, so you can drop that fat with you. And this is going to take us right down to Cooper's ligament here. There's a lot of fat along the inferior epigastric. You don't need to totally defat it. And this is down at the femoral canal area. Okay. A bit of a blood vessel. Looks great. Okay, so the patient, uh, there, there's frequently a large artery that traverses across the um, Cooper's ligament, and this patient has a giant one here. You can see it's going almost, it looks like it's going into the femoral canal. This is the femoral canal right here. 
and this is called the corona mortis. And you need to be aware that it's there. Most people will have some vascular structure down here. So he's got a big corona mortis um, artery. And then you can see these veins running along the top. And so um, as you're doing the dissection, you need to watch out for those. I think these guys will probably take. And so I'm thinking about where we're going to anchor the mesh. We're going to put a stitch here, and we just need to be sure we don't hurt this little vein and artery here. Here's the uh, adminiculum of the linea alba. This is the midline. Here's the rectus muscle inserting to the pubic bone, chronomortis vein, artery here. Here's Cooper's ligament. Here's the femoral canal. The medial board of the femoral canal is the lacunar ligament which is just under this vein, but it's a semicircular ligament. And that goes down and meets the inguinal ligament on the outside. You can see the infraparagastrics very nicely now. Here's the testicular artery and vein. And here is the vas deferens coming down. Okay, so we're almost done with our dissection. The only thing is we want to strip the peritoneum back a little bit farther. So. plane is here. Just take peritoneum up and we want all those gonadal vessels to drop to the floor. So it's a little bit of a sweeping move like this. And again, we just want to take only peritoneum and drop those gonadal vessels to the floor. So you can see the gonadal vessels coming like this. Okay, and I can see the psoas muscle coming into view which is what I want to see. You know, uh, some people ask, what's the end point of the peritoneal dissection? It's when you start to see this psoas muscle, that's how you know. We'll just do a little bit more. Now I put two little holes in the peritoneum. You can see how papery thin it is. Not a big deal, we'll close those at the end. I think it is important to close them though. So, um, we've seen cases where the small intestines has herniated through and caused an SBO. Okay, so I think that's adequate. So that's the completed dissection. Let's go through the anatomy one more time. Admoniculum, midline, rectus muscle, Cooper's ligament, femoral canal, corona mortis vessels, epigastric. So the direct space is right here, which is intact in this patient. Here's the indirect space. Cord structures, vas deferens, psoas musculature, uh, iliac artery and vein. Lateral femoral cutaneous nerve is right there. See it right there? Big white nerve coming right down there. You can see it's actually sending a little branches as it goes under the iliopubic tract. And here's a transverse abdominus muscle with its, uh, with the linea semilinaris, its atherosis. So this nerve is just a peripheral nerve, maybe a side branch of the uh, iliohypogastric ilioinguinal. Okay, so that's a nice dissection. Um, when you have an indirect, you also want to make sure that there's no, absolutely no cord lipomas, and if you have one, you want to reduce it. So this guy, I think, is pretty well skeletonized. There's nothing here. Okay, cool. So that is the hard part of the case, and so now the fun part, which is the reconstruction. So you can see our mesh that we pre-marked. Okay, team, so we're going to take sutures now. Yeah, we'll take the, t uh, so I use a 2.0 Tycron on an SH needle to anchor the mesh. I cut it to nine inches. And then I use a uh, 2.0 absorbable V-lock suture for the peritoneal flap. Now you can use a um, absorbable suture if you want. I know surgeons who use a Vicryl to anchor the mesh. Surgeons who don't do any mesh anchoring, and there's some data to back up those practices. Yeah, I, I'll take the uh, other one also. American surgeons who I've spoken to 
for at uh, Cooper's ligament. That's pretty constant. And a lot of them put a lateral suture in, and I do two sutures and you're about to see that. Okay, so here's our barred 3D Max mesh. So this is a contoured mesh. And I usually uh, like to fits around and make sure I get it perfect. The base idea is the black dot goes at the internal ring. You really want the mesh to extend all the way to the midline, and you want good overlap on the Cooper's ligament. So here's the midline cleft. So that's about to midline. Here's Cooper's ligament. Okay, and then laterally, it's flat, and you want this black line to be basically along the iliopubic tract. So that's looking pretty good like that. And then you can see my inferior epigastric, you can see I was pretty close. Here's Cooper's ligament and the iliopubic tract. And you want the black to basically be at the center of what the Mercedes Benz sign. So the Mercedes Benz, if you visualize inferior epigastric, vast deference, and gonadals, it forms like kind of a Mercedes Benz sign. So the black dot should be about the middle of the Mercedes Benz. Okay, so we're going to put a suture at Cooper's ligament. Now, remember that corona mortis was over there. So I don't want to stick the corona mortis. Um, this mesh, you can't see through that well. So you just have to be careful. And so I'm going to take a scything bite and try to get some of that Cooper's ligament. That looks good. And I'm going to leave the needle there. And before I tie, I just want to make sure I love how the mesh is laying. And this looks really good to me. It, you get nice coverage of the defect. Mesh is laying relatively flat. So we'll commit to that, and then I'm going to tie that up. Grip mesh has become pretty popular for this operation because you don't have to fix it, and it always lays flat. Never tried it. Uh, my only reservation is a, it's a polyester mesh. I'm a little worried if it got infected, my ability to treat through the infection without explanting the mesh. I think polyester is a little closer to Gore-Tex in the sense that if you puss out polyester, pretty much the mesh has to come out. My partner would argue that neither of us have ever seen an infection in our cumulative experiences, so the infection risk is pretty low. Okay, so we're gonna put one suture at Cooper's ligament, and then some surgeons are done, but I kind of think that, especially for indirects, but I, in all comers, I put a lateral suture. And the key thing for this one is you want to make sure that you are above the iliopubic tract because below is where your nerve is. So it's pretty obvious in this guy. So we want to be kind of up in here. So what I want to do is I just want to push that mesh in and kind of that's laying perfectly flat. And then I'll put a suture here. Now, some people worry that this suture could cause pain because if I had x-ray vision and I could look through that muscle, I would see somewhere in there the iliohypogastric and the ilioingual nerve. So how do I know I didn't just stitch through the nerve out of you? And, and I don't know. So we're taking a little risk. But if you think about recurrence, what happens is if this mesh flips anteriorly and the peritoneum gets back here, that's how you get an indirect recurrence. Recurrences recapitulate the original surgeon, sur the original defects. So this guy, if he gets a recurrence, it's going to be an indirect recurrence, probably. See how I tie? I do a slip knot. So I do two half hitches, and then I slip it down on a post, just like you would tie open. Okay, so this looks really nice. I think that looks good. It's covering my direct space. It goes to the midline. It's covering the hernia space and it's laying flat. And you can see it's a little, this patient's anatomy is a little distorted. Okay. All right, so I'm gonna put this suture down. We're gonna need it to close those little holes in the end. Our next step is we're just gonna close the peritoneum. And I suspect most of you in the audience are going to be familiar with this product, but what it is is it's a barbed suture. And these little textures are little barbs, so the suture only pulls through the tissue in one direction. You can see when I pull it, see how it pulls tight, but it doesn't loosen again? So that's a really nice key. So again, um, I made the kind of the point, it's nice to take down transverse fascia or maybe even a little posterior sheath 
because then that gives you a really nice, uh, sturdy uh, structure to suture to. And you don't have to worry about ripping the peritoneum as you suture it. That looks pretty reasonable. And then we're gonna go three sutures the other way. And that's what locks the suture. Obviously, as you're suturing this, you don't want to hit the inferior epigastric vessels. Okay, so we'll go three. That took the loop out. Okay. Now, I would be done with the console part if I had not ripped those little holes in the peritoneum. So we want to go down and address those. Now, the peritoneum can produce an SBO. So if, I don't know if these holes are big enough for bowel to sneak in, but I'm not gonna take the risk. What we'll do is we'll start at the bottom and run it. You don't wanna leave holes in the peritoneum. We're just gonna stitch these up. Notice this is exactly where that omentum was. So when we took down those omental adhesions, essentially no peritoneum, very weak peritoneum. What I'm going to do is just run this up. And there's one more up there. This looks like it's come together pretty nicely. Okay, that'll be good. Don't have a ton of suture here, but hopefully it'll be enough to tie. It's pretty reasonable. Might be a little tricky to tie this because I'm a little bit short. Let's see. Okay, that looks pretty good. Great. Okay, so that's the um, console part of the operation. And look, looks beautiful. Dolls look good. Okay, Mark, can I hand these sutures back to you? Okay, so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to scrub back in and we're just going to finish operation. So we've got all the uh, sutures out already. So we just need to close the ports. And so, okay, so that's our 12 port we're looking at laparoscopically. So we're gonna close that with the inlet closure device. And I use a Carter Thomason device. And this is a number one Vicryl. Now um, this port was originally placed through the rectus sheath off midline. And so, the sutures go, you can see the holes, it's one, one hole towards the head and one hole towards the foot. And you have to do it one-handed, and it's a little back, almost there, got it. Okay. That's one of the problems is the robot ports don't have ribs, and so there can be more friction between the valve and the scope than there is between the port and the patient. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So if you push the yeah, scope in, it advances the port. <coughs> so once you understand that, then mm -hmm. you know that you can solve it just by stabilizing with your contralateral hand. Okay, I'm gonna need local next. Okay, so one suture in the 12 port is what we use. The eight ports don't need to be closed. Don't need a fascial fixation, that is. That feels great. Okay, and then we're gonna do a rectus sheath block. And so we do that under laparoscopic guidance. So I just stick the needle just a little cephalad to the suture line. There it is. So a little bit preperitoneal space and then I inject while I'm withdrawing and at some point the needle will be in the rectus space. And so we put a generous amount, and we'll go lateral, which will be kind of up there. Get the lateral rectus sheath, and then we'll go inferior. Right there. Peritoneum, and then rectus muscle. Great, perfect. So that's our rectus sheath block. And then we're done. You can come on out. Desufflate. Yeah.
great. 18 to blow, so. Okay. Late 18. 18, yeah. All right, well, thank you very much, Mark.